Okay, time to get going. So uh, here's where we were last. Oh no, it isn't. Uh, here's where we were last time. Uh, we were talking about uh, center of mass, and remember, we kind of worked our way up to this. We first started talking about weighted averages. We talked about sort of you know discrete weighted averages where you have just a handful of numbers, and some of them you might want to count twice. And then we realized once we have that in a formula. It doesn't really have to be an integer weight, right? So we had a general idea of weighted average. Then we pointed out you can generalize that to a continuum and talk about a weighted average of a function, right? And uh, then uh, this is the last sort of extension we made, which is to make uh, a very elegant definition of this important physics concept called center of mass. And critically, what a center of mass is, is it's the weighted average of position. So you can see right here, that's our generic formula. I'm starting, of course, with a discrete, you know, finite number of masses. But that's our generic weighted average formula. And specifically, you can see that position is what we're taking the weighted average of. So where the masses are is what we're taking the weighted average of. Now, uh, what are the weights? Well, uh, hopefully no surprise, the weights are the masses themselves. How much mass is there? How much, possibly more, mass is there? Right? So, um, you know, I, you might be sold on the idea that when you have multiple masses, the average of their positions kind of makes sense, right? But the weighted average, you would think, should count more because more weight should mean that position literally has more weight at it, right? Uh, so it seems like a natural thing to want to talk about. Uh, what is not immediately obvious but is also true, and this is a nice little exercise if you're in the market for such a thing, um, is, to point, is to make the connection that this is also what you might call the balance point, a.k.a. it's where your total torque is equal to zero. In other words, if you put your finger right there, and you put your finger right there like this, then the amount of torque that the first mass is pulling counterclockwise and the amount of torque with which the second mass is sort of pulling it clockwise, that those are equal and opposite and therefore balance. So that, again, is just a little exercise, and if you're interested, in, uh, you, you can welcome to. Okay, so um, anyway, that noted... Uh, we can generalize to a continuum, a bunch of different masses in the usual way, right? Again, notice we're taking a weighted average of position, right? The x uh, position vector is position weighted by mass, again, of course. Okay, and the last thing that we did, as I recall, is we pointed out that uh, technically we had not defined what it means to take an integral, mm, excuse me, of a vector-valued integrand. And the really good news on this is that, yeah, it's exactly what you would hope it be, would be. This integrand has several coordinates. You just perform the integral on each coordinate individually. It's exactly what you would hope, uh, and uh, that's what I've got written out uh, right here. Okay, so let's see an example of this in action. Uh, we're going to compute a center of mass. Uh, in particular, our uh, domain is this upper half disk. I didn't hit that very well, but uh, that upper half disk uh, right there, uh, get radius A. Um, I'm going to, in this exercise, just use 1 as the density. Eh, you know, it could be something different. It doesn't even have to be constant, right? But uh, just to keep the, the, the calculations uh, reasonable, I'm going to do it like this. Um, and uh, here we go. So uh, trying to find the x-coordinate of the center of mass, here is the formula. And there's two different ways that you can compute this, one of which is actually legitimate in Math 219. And that is to make the easy observation that this integral right here is zero by symmetry. I love it when stuff like this happens. And by the way, this is the kind of thing you may recall that I made this assertion that this you know, symmetry arguments came up a lot in physics. Well, it was for reasons kind of like this. The world is full of symmetric shapes. And therefore, the study of the physical world is full of symmetric integrals. Right? It's really not that surprising. But really important uh, to be able to notice stuff like this when it happens. Now, if this were a physics course, which it's not, 
right? But if this were a physics course, then there's a different argument that you could make, uh, which is that, uh, you know, why is the uh, x coordinate of the center of mass equal to zero? Well, because the, the, the mass clearly would balance if you supported it along the center, because there's equal torques on each side, right, per the physics interpretation that I just made a reference to a minute ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a physics argument, though, right? Now, it's a valid physics argument, but again, I emphasize this is not a physics class. Our, in this class, our only interest in physics is uh, how it can be in service to math, right? How it gives us physical examples of mathematical ideas that are actually what we're actually interested <laughs> in is math, right? So, um, uh, a physics answer to a math question is not what this course is about. So please don't give me physics arguments. Uh, I'm interested in math arguments. Okay, how are we doing, by the way? Is everybody doing all right? Everybody happy? Let's compute the second coordinate of the center of mass. Let's compute the y coordinate of the center of mass. Again, that's the formula. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of uh, uh, punching it out. Uh, now, no symmetry argument. Again, now very tempting. Please don't step on this landmine, right? Very dangerous to observe that, hey, check it out. My domain is symmetric. Gonna love it, right? Uh, my integrand appears to have an odd exponent, right? You see daylight, you run for daylight, right? It looks like you're gonna, but it doesn't work. And if you check through the details, <laughs> definitely does not work. So again, this is, this is kind of a landmine. If you, if you claim that this is zero by symmetry, not only is the answer wrong, but the argument doesn't make any sense either. And any progress toward that argument is progress toward a dead end and doesn't count for really anything. So be very, very careful about that. Now, here, here's a, a one way that you can sort of detect this kind of danger in advance, not that this will always work, but it's pretty obvious. Now, this is just physics intuition. This is just kind of cheat sheet, you know, uh, strategy. I, the, you're pretty clear the center of mass is, I mean, it's just like ish about right there, right? It's clearly not a zero Y coordinate. Our odd symmetry theorem only gives us answers of integrals being zero. Obviously, zero is not the right answer, so it should immediately be eliminated that you might even entertain the possibility that this could possibly be zero. I hope that makes sense. And again, that's not, uh, that's not a, really a math argument. That's a strategy. That's a test-taking uh, uh, insight. Okay. All right. Now, uh, how to compute this integral. Uh, this integral... You can compute in either of uh, these two different ways, uh, uh, which is better, right? uh, different points of view there, uh, pros and cons. Um, neither one of them is particularly um, uh, better than the other, um, uh, except in one way that we haven't talked about. Both of them have square roots in the bounds. Right? Neither one of them slices through a corner. But I do have a slight preference for one of these. And it's hard to see these coming uh, other than, you know, maybe writing them both down. Or, you know, I look, I've been down this particular road several times in my life. And so I've, 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 I know how to look for the earmarks of this kind of thing. But check out what we have down here. My very first anti-differentiation that I'll be doing in this second integral, y dy, that's going to give me a y squared. And I'll be plugging this, this, uh, a square root that I'm scared of into a square antiderivative. A square root disappears in a puff of smoke. And so that's kind of awesome, right? So this is something that you can, without too terribly much trouble, <laughs> kind of have on your radar, kind of be uh, looking for opportunities for, you know, convenient ways to get rid of ugliness, right? Whereas uh, if you uh, ask, well, you know, what happens up here? Well, here we're going to end up with basically y times that square root, um, which, you know, you can do with a u substitution. Yeah, 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 fine. But, yeah, it's, I feel like that's a little bit more work. Okay. Okay. All right, next. Oh, sorry. Yeah, question. Uh, yeah, so for that first problem, like, I understand, like, why we know that y hat is equal to zero, but, like, where does the symmetry argument break down? Because, like, 
does have to be some symmetric on both on both intervals? Um, so the, what you need for a, for a symmetry argument to work is you need for your domain to be symmetric, right? And you need for your integrand to be symmetric. But very importantly, they have to be symmetric over the same line, right? right? So uh, the domain is symmetric over that line. The integrand y is symmetric when you reflect like this, which means symmetric over that line. And so, uh, yeah, different lines. And that's the that's the problem. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh you know it's, so this is a great example of you know the the warning that I gave you all last time, which was you know you gotta be really careful when you make the symmetry arguments because the little subtleties, the little subtleties are the difference between having a perfectly valid symmetry argument and an absolutely invalid, you know, just dead in the water it doesn't work. Uh, attempt at a symmetry argument. So, yeah. so please do be very, very careful. Thank you for that question. That was a good question. Um, okay, moving along. So here's another physics idea. Uh, and again, this is not a physics class, so I'm not going to present this as I would if I were teaching a physics class. Um, I'm going to start off with a uh, kind of a little tool that we're going to need for convenience. So I hope you all remember this formula. Uh, from uh, from high school geometry that uh, arc length uh, is related to the internal angle uh, by uh, multiplying by the radius. So a classic old formula. And you can just take a derivative of that with respect to time, and what that gives you is a really nice uh, little relationship between what you might call linear speed, namely, what is the rate of change of a linear measure of position and what we call angular speed. Angular speed is a rate of change of an angular measure of position. Right? So uh, these are uh, different, uh, different rates of change that help us understand how something is moving. Right? So it's perfectly reasonable to call both of these speeds, even though they are very different things. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, by the way, just a quick heads up. Uh, this one here is sometimes called angular velocity. That kind of rubs my fur backwards because uh, velocity is supposed to be a vector. This is not a vector. This is a clearly scalar quantity. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's better to call this angular speed. But heads up, you're going to hear angular velocity. Okay. All right, so uh, now here comes the big question we're going to ask. Suppose uh, you have some object like this, and it's rotating around an axis per this picture. Well, if it's an object that has mass and it's moving, we can reasonably ask what the kinetic energy is. And again, this is not a physics class, so if you're not comfortable with the idea of kinetic energy, if you've never heard of that or something like that, um, we don't have time to go into that good news. You don't really need to know what it is, uh, other than that it's computed by a particular formula that uh, I'm going to write down in a couple minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, roughly speaking, though, energy is what we use to do things. Kinetic energy says how much of this stuff that we use to do things has gone into making this object moving as fast as it's moving. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so uh, how do we do this? Well, no problem. I can just compute the velocity, and there's, again, we have a standard formula for kinetic energy. Fine, cool, nothing to it. But what if I have a large blob like this uh, that is rotating around this axis? And here's the nasty problem. The nasty problem is that this little piece of mass only travels a relatively short distance in the amount of time it takes the blob to do a rotation, whereas this little piece of mass over here, oh gosh, uh, travels a much greater distance in that same amount of time, which means this little piece of mass is moving less fast, this little <coughs> piece of mass is moving more fast. They don't have the same speeds, and so I cannot use my standard kinetic energy formula based on speed. So how do we deal with this? And the uh, way we deal, pretty natural um, physics idea. By the way, here's our formula for kinetic energy, our sort of general formula for kinetic energy, mass and speed. 
Uh, so what we're going to do is take this problem where we have a blob. We want to know the kinetic energy of this blob as it's moving around. And I just make an argument that the whole is the sum of the parts. This is a chop it up, add it up situation. This is an accumulating quantity. The total kinetic energy is the sum of the pieces of kinetic energy if you look at each piece individually. And looking at each piece individually, it's actually a relatively simple story. Each little piece, let's look at that little piece right there. That little piece, all the mass in that piece is moving pretty much the same velocity. Speed, excuse me, they got me, speed, right? Um, and uh, so on that piece, I can just say, yeah, kinetic energy is, yeah, it's one-half mv squared. However much mass, dm, is in that little piece? One-half mv squared, there you go. And then you just add up over the entire solid. That, of course, is what a triple integral is. <laughs> and uh, yada, 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 with the algebra, y'all should be, this is a nice exercise to go through this algebra and make sure you see how, what factors out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, the nice punchline is that you can rewrite your kinetic energy formula like this, and then you make the very clever insight, very clever, that this formula if you make one little change, if you just redefine this expression to be a new quantity that I'm gonna call moment of inertia, if you just make that one little move, then look what happens. Our formula for kinetic energy starts to look familiar. When you have linear motion, it's one half mass times linear speed squared when you have angular motion, it's one half of this other thing times now angular speed. Angular, <laughs> I should emphasize, uh, speed squared. Right? So um, these formulas looking so much alike, it's pretty tempting and I think very reasonable and valuable to say, okay, well then in the same sense that this is an angular analog of speed, Likewise, this thing, oh, uh, wrong color, uh, this thing, whatever it is, is kind of an angular analog of mass. And that's, um, that's why we're interested in this expression. That's why we're interested in an integral of r squared dm. It's because that is the, um, the, the magic expression that factors in all of this, you know, different distances to the axis, different linear speeds as it's rotating uh, uh, stuff, and allows you to compute kinetic energy with a very familiar looking structure. So that's a, a really neat idea. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about the physics there. Um, <clears throat> this is why we care about uh, moment of inertia, this expression. Right there. Now, uh, a subtlety is, uh, let's talk about this r. The little r in that expression is, uh, okay, well, let's see, it's tempting to say, doesn't that look a lot like the cylindrical coordinate r? And importantly, it's not. Importantly, look back up to here to where we uh, started this whole process. We were using r eh, uh, to represent distance from the axis of rotation. And there's lots of different axes that something might be rotating around, right? It's not necessarily just the z-axis. So when we write down this expression, integral r squared dm, you have to interpret r appropriately. So yes, if you are going around the z-axis, then uh, sure, yes, absolutely, distance from the z-axis is the usual cylindrical r. And that's nice, and sometimes that's even the scenario you're considering, right? Um, but uh, we have to recognize, uh, sometimes stuff is rotating around a different line. And if you are rotating around a different line, then the distance from that different line, this is definitely very much not the cylindrical coordinate r. So uh, please be very careful. Please think through uh, what the corresponding distance is that we're talking about and uh, make sure to express that appropriately in your algebra.
so I have a couple of different scenarios here that I've documented. Um, you think through the geometry of these scenarios and how I get these formulas uh, for, uh, for what R is in those cases. Okay. All right, so example. Now, this is just a matter of kind of uh, writing it down and doing it. Um, getting zoomed in appropriately. There we go. Uh, so uh, our shape that we're interested in is this. I have mass distributed over that shape um, with the uh, density given by uh, this expression right here. That tells you how much mass is where in that shape. Okay. And uh, for whatever reason, we want to entertain the possibility that this might be rotating around the x-axis. So here's my x-axis, and now you could imagine this thing sort of rotating around the x-axis. And um, what is in that scenario, what is the moment of inertia? In other words, if I, if I want to know how do I compute kinetic energy, this kinetic energy of this thing rotating around, what's going to play the role of mass in that calculation? And uh, of course, our formula for that is uh, integral r squared dm. This is just a double integral because our domain is two-dimensional. Right. Uh, we have to interpret appropriately what is our R. Uh, what do I? What is this R thing right there? Well, here it is in the picture. Yeah, there it is. Right. That for, so from any little bitty piece of mass. Uh, let's see here. Where, oh, uh, that's the okay. For, from from any little piece of mass, what is the distance to the axis that it's rotating around? Well, if this is x comma y. The distance is literally the vertical coordinate. It is literally y. And so this r is exactly y. And everything else is plug and chug. Everybody all right? OK. All right. Uh, by the way, I will take this opportunity real quick to um, uh, to point out that sometimes your integrals will end up involving a bunch of trig. Uh, don't forget Calc 2 is in the prerequisite trail for this course. Uh, so I am going to assume that you're good with all your old, you know, you know trig integration formulas. Um, so uh, make sure to think this through. There's little tricks for how to do the, the sort of the two separate integrals, right? There's, there's two terms uh, uh, in that factor. So uh, effectively two separate integrals here. Make sure you remember what are the clever tricks that allow you to compute these two separate integrals. Okay. All right. And that does it for Chapter 5. And off we go now into Chapter 6. Okay. Oh, uh, before we get into Chapter 6, maybe let me just remind y'all, um, don't forget we have an exam on Friday, right? I'm sure y'all uh, all remembered that. Uh, but uh, also don't forget that the fair game material for Exam 2 on Friday uh, has already been set, right? And it, uh, we did not finish this last section. Uh, I think this is 5.6. We did not finish this last section, uh, and thus it is not on the material that we finished on Monday, and therefore it is not fair game for the midterm on Friday. Uh, but that said, it is definitely, and likewise with this stuff, fair game for exam three and fair game for the final. And, and uh, I know you all know how fast the end of the semester moves. And so uh, this is going to be coming up not that long from now. So uh, anyway. Okay, so here's the uh, new idea that we're going to start with in Chapter 6. Um, I want to first recognize that there's been a very nice convenience that we've enjoyed for every kind of integral that we've talked about so far, and that is the domains have been what I'm going to call the right dimension. We did double integrals in R2 over two-dimensional domains, right? We do triple integrals in R3 three over three-dimensional domains. Everything is, the domain is the same dimension as the world it lives in. 
Single variable integrals, right? A one-dimensional integral, one-dimensional domain inside of a one-dimensional world. Um, so what we're going to do now is entertain weirder, dimensionally weirder scenarios. Like, uh, for example, if you have a curve in the plane. So there's the curve. But notice this curve lives inside of a two-dimensional world, not a one-dimensional world but it is a one dimensional domain. And so now let's so here's a here's a perfectly plausible very real world scenario. Suppose I have a wire that's bent uh, like this, right? And let's suppose that the density is not constant and the density depends on location, density depends on x and y. How would I, I mean, how do I add that? How do I do the appropriate integral? I, I can't just say that this is a single variable integral because it's a one dimensional domain because we don't know how to do integrals on curved, single variable integrals on curved sets. It's not a thing that we've seen, right? And now it's tempting to say, okay, yeah, 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 two dimensional, right? Two dimensional thing. So um, maybe I'll use a double integral. There's no double integral to talk about. There's no area. Right? So this does not fit with anything that we've done before. And so we have to make a whole new kind of integral, uh, a whole new kind of Riemann sum in order to be able to address scenarios like this. Oh, here's another, again, very real world scenario that uh, I actually did this calculation one time uh, for my own personal entertainment. Imagine that this is a uh, driveway. I suppose you, uh, like I used to, live on a uh, on a property where there's a very long driveway, and it snows, and you've got to shovel all that snow. That's a lot of work, and there's something satisfying about being able to tell people exactly how much work you did, right? <laughs> and so I wanted to be able to talk about I shoveled this much snow anyway. Um, so uh, yeah, so. Uh, a driveway technically is kind of two-dimensional, but that's a pretty weird way to think about it. It's basically, it follows a path, and on each little bitty piece of the driveway, you can talk about, okay, you know, over that one foot of driveway, how much work did it take to shovel all of the snow on that one foot of length of the driveway, right? And then add up over the entire length. So this kind of integral is a very, very common thing in the real world. Okay, so how do we do that? It's uh, what I've, um, uh, 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 how I've summarized every other kind of integral we've ever done. Chop it up, add it up. Right, the whole is the sum of the parts. And if you want to know uh, the whole amount of work that it takes to shovel that long driveway, well, you're going to look at one little piece at a time. On each little piece, you're going to have uh, some, I don't know, it depends on the application, right? There's lots of accumulating quantities we might be interested in. If you're shoveling snow, then, okay, there's going to be some expression that tells you how much work it took to shovel that little bit of snow, right? Um, <clears throat> and you can write that down, and it's going to be proportional to the length of that little piece. Um, so there's going to be then an expression that you multiply by length that gives you the quantity in question, and this is what we're going to call a density. Just like every other kind of integral we've seen, there's been the integrand has been a density. It's whatever quantity you're interested in per unit size, in this case per unit length of the curve. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's what you get on each little piece, and then you add up over the entire curve, and uh, take a limit for good measure to make round off errors go away, as we always do. And uh, there you go. There is an expression that I can compute that tells me how much work, you know, it takes to shovel that driveway, or how much mass there is on that bent wire, or how many... Um, Mm, uh, how many uh, ants there are crawling along along a stretch of road? I don't know. Whatever it might be. Okay. So uh, before I go on, 
real quick. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody see the general idea? The whole is the sum of the parts. It's, again, accumulating quantities, you know, just like every other integral we've seen. So uh, Riemann sum addresses the problem. We're going to need to be able to compute these. Not clear how we're going to do it. That'll come in a minute. Um, but we are first going to write down a convenient notation. And I think this convenient notation is pretty believable. I mean, uh, this is what we've done in the past. The limit of a summation, we use an integral symbol for that. And uh, delta size d size. Right? All of that's pretty standard, right? I think this is, ex this is kind of the notation that you should expect in some sense. Um, and then furthermore, notice that the shape... Oh, gosh, color choices. Uh, the shape over which you're doing this Riemann sum. In other words, the, the domain, the, the, the thing that you're chopping up, right? That thing being the domain we write as a subscript. So very believable notation, just like, you know, I'll say shameless ripoff of notations we've used before. Um, also terminology, this namely this Riemann sum to compute that quantity. This is called a scalar line integral. And uh, the terminology, I hope, uh, it's, uh, it's a little annoying. Um, sadly, uh, it says line integral, even though that's not a line. It's a curve. I think a case could be made this should be called a curve integral, but nobody says that that I'm aware of. Um, some people do call it a path integral. That's a uh, less common choice. And so anyway, I, I suggest we just get on board with the most common choice, namely call it a line integral, and we just kind of have to get over the fact that it's not a line. Uh, so anyway, everybody okay with that? Um, now, another thing I should point out about the notation, why do we call this a scalar line integral? And uh, I will point out that our integrand is a scalar. Unremarkable observation. Uh, furthermore, our differential is a scalar, to which you might be thinking, yeah, of course, like every other integral we've ever seen. So why make this seemingly pointless distinction? And uh, that's a, a reasonable complaint as of right now. And let me just kind of uh, foreshadowing just a little bit. We're going to see very soon another kind of line integral in which these are not scalars. And that, we'll get to that in a few. So anyway. Um, okay, uh, moving along. So how are we going to compute these things? Um, and let me remind you what we've, what we've done in uh, change of variables. Uh, now, I know that was a bit ago, right? Change variables. Uh, but uh, we did have a strategy when we were dealing with change of variables, which is view your domain as being an image of something, and then we use this pullback stretching factor strategy. And the nice punchline was that you could take your ugly domain that you don't like and rewrite the integral in terms of uh, a new domain that you do like. Very, very powerful, very powerful strategy. And well, in our new situation here, looking at our domain, um, here we go, looking at our domain here, um, still a domain we don't like for different reasons, right? With change of variables, the reason we didn't like our original domains with change of variables is because the curves were all messed up and there were corners and uh, it just doesn't, uh, it's just inconvenient, right? But now we have a different reason not to like a domain. It's dimensionally uh, out of place. It's dimensionally awkward. And it's a one-dimensional domain and a two-dimensional world. It's just, uh, right, because of the dimensions. So different reason to dislike it, but still it's undesirable and we're going to deal with it in the same way. We're going to view this as being an image, right? It's an image of a domain that we do like. And then we're going to use the pullback stretching factor strategy to rewrite everything that was in our XY world. We're going to rewrite in terms of T. So big picture, it's just like change of variables. 
A um, couple of bits of good news. Um, I already know how to do this. I already know how to make a curve an image. That's a parameterization. That's what a parameterization is. Right? You find a way to, to create a function where the outputs from the function <laughs> trace out your curve. Perfect. It's just what I wanted. Right? So good news. We're already halfway there. Just per step one, parameterize your curve. Um, in doing the pullback, another lucky break. I know how much distance <laughs> is covered in some small amount of time. What's the relationship between distance and time? Speed. Right? Again, we already knew this in some sense, right? So uh, let's see here. So speed uh, is what you multiply by dt to get ds. And speed is easy to compute. It's the magnitude of the velocity vector. And so that is our stretching factor that we stick in there. And uh, we're done. We actually have ourselves now a perfectly fine formula for how to compute one of these mysterious brand new kinds of integrals, uh, this, uh, this creepy, dimensionally awkward uh, line integral thing, right, that we just wrote down. Eh, no problem. It's, here's your formula. Boom. This is single variable integral. A to B, DT, plug and chug. Is that cool? All right, uh, let's see here. So uh, let me uh, yeah, do like this. Okay, so that's how you compute scalar line integrals. Um, a, a real quick uh, little, um, let me address a possible complaint. Uh, some of you might object that, uh, hey, 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 this formula <laughs> depends on my parameterization. There are lots of different parameterizations. Different parameterizations will give me different integrals. How do I know which parameterization to use uh, to give me the right answer? And the good news here is it doesn't matter. Right? This above expression is independent of parameterization. Now, if this were a, if this were Math 222, we would prove that, um, and our textbook proves that. And that's not what we're here for. So all the discussion that's in the book about uh, demonstrating that the parameterization uh, doesn't matter is uh, you don't need to worry about that stuff. And I'm uh, morally certain that I've uh, documented that on the content syllabus. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, nice punchline. Use whatever parameterization is most convenient. Okay, so let's do one. Actually, let's do four. Um, I have a scenario here, wire, non-constant density. So and keep in mind, this being a wire, this being uh, you know following a curve, this means mass per unit length on, of the wire. Okay. And I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that I might want to compute. You might want to compute the mass of that wire, or you might want to compute the uh, moment of inertia of that wire, or you might want to compute the center of mass of that wire, which has uh, both an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. There's a bunch of different quantities that you might want to compute for that wire. And they all, <laughs> very conveniently, because it's the same wire for all, actually, let me do this. Because it's the same wire for all of these questions, mass, center of mass, whatever. Same wire, it's following the same curve which we can parameterize the same way for all of them. They're going to have the same range of values of t because you're using the exact same parameterization for all of these questions. Um, same parameterization means same velocity, therefore same stretching factor, same result for the stretching factor. All of this is the same for all four of these questions. Even though they're totally different quantities, we're talking about the same wire, and so you get a lot of common features. And so that's, that's why I like to do these examples kind of all at the same time. So again, it is technically four different integrals here, but they're going to follow pretty much the same pattern. So um, I'm going to focus now on just the top two. 
Uh, let's look at, uh, let's see here, um, let me do it like this to get started. Um, uh, we have on the left here how we'd compute mass. We have on the right over here uh, how we would compute the x coordinate of the center of mass. There's also a y coordinate below. Y'all can watch later if you like. Um, and uh, let's see how these calculations proceed. So um, it's, it's very uh, analogous to things we've done before. Mass, the whole is the sum of the parts. Very first thing we write down. <coughs> X coordinate of the center of mass, we have a PAT formula for that as well. All right. And now we just kind of start uh, using what we already know. Um, mass is mass per unit length times length. And check it out, that applies to both of our integrals. Uh, the formula that we have for density. Density is X plus Y. Okay, that applies for both of these. Exact same way. Um, oh, let's see here. Uh, the formula we have from the previous page that uh, ds is stretching factor times dt. Well, yeah. Right? Same for both. Because, again, same curve, same argument, really. Um, uh, what our stretching factor is. Right? Still x prime. For both of these, so you can see there's a tremendous amount of pattern that shows up uh, when you're uh, when you're doing these calculations, and uh, uh, that's uh, that's a convenient thing to, to notice. Um, <clears throat> okay, now how do we how do we do the pullback? How do we actually rewrite all of this in terms of t? Uh, don't forget that the parameterization tells you how to do the pullback. This thing right here, the first coordinate of my parameterization, uh, yeah, that's x. That's literally telling you how to plug in for x. x is t. Uh, everywhere in all of these calculations that an x comes up, it is t. And likewise, uh, y <coughs> is t squared. So, okay, that y is t squared. This y is t t squared. Right? So again, just plugging in from our change of variables. Well, okay, technically technically this isn't a change of variables function. It doesn't dimensionally fit, but it's, it's playing morally the same role as a change of variables function. This is what we're pulling back through, right? So it's, it's a parameterization, not a change of variables function, but that's a, that's a terminological quibble. Right, so it's 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 as if it's the change of variables function. So that's where these pullback um, plug-in formulas come from. And notice now we are uh, done. Uh, we have turned these first two questions into single variable integrals that are merely matters of plug and chug at this point. And uh, you know, off you go. How are we doing? Everybody, all right. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, some of these integrals are hard. Um, I, and, uh, you know, again, I'm not a monster. I'm not going to make you compute uh, uh, integrals that would require multiple pages of de terrible uh, substitutions. I, I want to make sure that you're, that you're able to do standard, you know, straightforward integrals. But these are uh, pretty doggone inconvenient, and I, I wouldn't make you evaluate these, these uh, in particular. Okay. All right, here's another example. Uh, another vaguely real world, plausibly, I'll say, real world scenario. Uh, suppose you have a fence, and uh, your fence has these uh, pickets, you know, like this. And you want to compute uh, the amount of area uh, on this fence. So the grand total amount of area, um, and in particular, uh, we know that uh, the fence is sitting on the unit circle, so I know what curve this fence follows, and I also know how height varies. So uh, keep in mind, uh, the, you know, not all pickets have to be the same height. Some of them might be higher, right? Some of them might be relatively low. 
right? And what we have here is uh, for whatever reason, this is the formula for our height. Uh, it depends on position. It depends on x in this case. And you know, why would you, again would you want a fence of non-constant height? Um, you know, maybe you're growing a vegetable garden on one side of your property, and you want the fence lower so we get more sun. Uh, but uh, your house is over by the other side. You don't want that direct afternoon sun blaring into your bay window, and uh, maybe you want it higher there. Something like that, right? Again, it's not an outrage uh, to uh, to you know, entertain such possibilities. Okay. okay, so how do we figure out the area if the height varies? I can't just say height times length. The height's not constant. Right? But I can do the following. I can say that the hull over the entire curve is the sum of the individual pieces of area, these individual, uh, you know, area of each picket, you might call it, right? So the whole is the sum of the parts. Now, that's just a geometric appeal. Yeah? Right? Um, on each picket, it's not hard to argue that height uh, times... Oh, let's see, her color choices. Uh, height times the length of the base here. DS, right, representing the length of that little piece of curve. I mean, it's it's two things. It's the width of the picket, and it's also the length of a little piece of curve. Right, so DS. Uh, so height times width is what gives you area of each picket. And lo and behold... Check it out. Uh, we have ourselves a scalar line integral, right? So the, the thing that I want to compute is a scalar line integral. Now we just have to figure out how to compute that scalar line integral. Pausing again real quick to make sure everybody's uh, on board. Yeah, cool. Okay, so, okay, well, how are we going to compute that? Well, we know we have to parameterize our curve. Our curve was given to be the unit circle, right? Parametrizing the unit circle is no big deal. We've done that long ago. Oh, yeah, there's lots of ways to parametrize the unit circle. Take your pick, right? Go crazy. Do whatever you want. I think this is the easiest one, right? I have a strong preference toward doing whatever is going to be most convenient. I think this is the most convenient. Um, and then uh, from that parameterization, you know, we uh, we compute our speed. Now, of course, you got to compute the velocity, and then you take the magnitude of the velocity. That's just a, a, a you know old calculations uh, right there uh, to compute your speed. And now it's very much just a matter of plugging and chugging. And let's see here. Let me. Um, yeah, uh, here we go. Uh, here was our integral for area. Uh, height, recall, was given. That expression was given. X plus 2 over 5, given in the statement of the question. Uh, here is our PAT formula for DS. Uh, DS is speed times DT. Uh, conveniently, we have just computed our speed Right? Our speed is 1. And let's see. Oh, wait a minute. What, uh, what's the deal with the x over here? Right, We've got this. Uh, yeah, let me get rid of the mess here. Um, I've got this x. How am I going to deal with x? What, 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 how, do, how do I write x in terms of t? Again, your change of variables function. Right, It says right here in this parameterization, x is cosine t. So... Bam, x is cosine t. And again, we have now turned this into a good old, plain old, nothing to it, single variable integral, totally doable. Make sure that you can compute uh, this, uh, this integral. And uh, this is a pretty good place to draw the line. And uh, we'll call it a day here. And uh, see you all on Friday for the exam. Again, uh, good luck to everybody with your studying.